Hey, today I'm, I'm just going to spend a few moments um, setting up, uh, I guess laying the foundation for, we've been talking about radical discipleship for uh, quite some time now. I think this is the fifth, fifth week that we're into it, and we're going to be here for a little bit as we say, because uh, we want to connect with what God is saying to us as a ministry and the call and the reason that we are here. So uh, we spent a, a lot of time in the past weeks or previous weeks explaining what discipleship is all about, what it means to kind of be a disciple. We looked at several words as it relates to biblically what a disciple is. So today, I want to begin the process of just looking at this passage in front of us so we can understand a little more of the commission that God has in store for us. I want to begin by making this opening statement, um, and that's pretty much the big idea of the story, uh, the message today. And that is, as a believer, um, you are commissioned to go and make disciples for Christ. So I need you to repeat after me. Just, just humor me with this. Say, as a believer, as a believer I, am I am commissioned to make disciples for Christ. One more, one more time. Say, as a believer, as a believer I, am I am commissioned to make disciples for Christ. Yeah, if you don't get anything else, I want us to just lock into that concept a little bit today. So I just want to take the next few minutes, won't be before you long, I'll pick this up next week to get deeper into it, but I just want to paint a picture for us to understand um, what it is we are called to do, what it is we're commissioned to do from this particular passage of Scripture that's in front of us. I don't know about you, but um, I was noticing uh, Keone's shirt. Um, he has on, I forgot what the number is, what was it? See, uh, y'all paid attention. Good. So his shirt worked. Now, the reason I'm pointing that out is because marketing, 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 and more marketing, right? And what I'm learning more about, about the goal of, of marketing is to kind of make us aware of, be it a product, be it a particular entity, be it whatever it is marketing is all about. But I, I'm going to go as far as to say it's not even so much to make you buy the product or be a part of the product, but I'm going to go as far as to say sometimes it becomes making you become one of, okay? Let me, let me illustrate what I mean. Um, everybody on the face of the earth know that when it comes to basketball, I'm a Lakers fan. When it comes to um, football, I'm a Dallas fan. Don't nobody boo. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so from time to time, what I do is I wear a uh, gear representative of the team that I like or the team that I represent. Now, the reason I think uh, Dallas, and the same is true with the, the Denver Broncos, and we'll talk about a little bit today, sell the gear that the players wear is not because you are a player. Come on, y'all. Yeah. You don't play for the Broncos. You don't, I don't play for the Cowboys, but we wear the gear. And the interesting thing about you putting on the gear is that they're hoping that they can win you over and, you know, get momentum in the market so the more they can publicize. And so here's what they say to their marketing team, go and sell the gear. Does that make sense, right? And so they'll use every available medium. I mean, they'll even use kids reading scriptures on a Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> they'll use whatever they can do to get you to buy over. So here's what this looks like. Here's how their marketing strategies work. The majority of us are you that are implants from other city that relocate to Denver. At first, you might not like the Broncos, but because the marketing team has been commissioned to go and win people over in time, the longer you stay here, the more you like them. Oh, come on, y'all. Hey, Amen. Give me a, yeah, yeah, no, you know, right, that's what happens. I mean, you know, Derek and I, uh, I don't see Derek yet. We're like, Derek and I are like secret Bronco fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's how we justify it. Well, we have an NFC team, and we have an AFC team. See, y'all don't know about the AFC team until they come together. You kind of get, but, but the point is, you kind of get what I'm saying. Um, the goal of these people, their entire marketing department, is to go and to win converts. And I think the strategy worked because over time, they end up doing what they need to do, and we buy in. 
okay? Now, I'm saying that to say this. This passage of Scripture that's in front of us, I think that's the underlying premise of what Jesus is trying to communicate in the text, and because we oftentimes spiritualize it so much, we don't understand that the objective, the mission of what he's trying to communicate is to win fans. You see what I'm saying? God wants everybody to wear a Jesus jersey. That's why I put on my Christocentric shirt this morning, right? That he wants to be the center of everything you do. So his hope, his prayer is that it doesn't matter where you are on the face of the earth that you're wearing his jersey, okay? And that when people see you, they know what team you are. Oh, come on, y'all. Yeah. When, when they see you, they know whose team you on. They knew who you represent, like the kids would say, who you're repping, okay? They'll understand that just by seeing your garb. The problem, the problem is because we don't understand what discipleship is or what it means to be a disciple, a lot of people see us and they really don't know whose team we're on. You kind of get what I'm saying? So I want to lay, begin the process just to share some of the benefits of what this means, and specifically just on the surface level, level, what this passage really speaks to so we can understand what it means to make disciples. So look with me, go with me to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Let me read and I'll share these two things with you, and then we will press on for a little while, okay? Um, verse 16 opens up by saying, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. Now, just by way of literary context, before we go further into this, here's what you need to know leading up to the passage. Jesus had just been crucified for the sins of the world by the cruel hands of the Roman Empire. Um, he had risen from the dead. In other words, he had conquered death, hell, and the grave. He's raised, and Mary Magdalene and the women's society went to visit the where they encountered the angel who said to them, he is not here, he has risen just like he said, and he's gone ahead of you into Galilee. And so the instruction was, go there and meet him. So what verse 16 is telling us that the 11 disciples went ahead to meet him in the mountain which he had said. Now look with me at verse 17. Verse 17 said, when they saw him, they worshiped him. And I love this phrase, and, and it presents some problems for the text, but it says, but some doubted. Does your Bible see that? So you, you have to keep in mind, it's 11 individuals um, because Judas had betrayed Christ and he departed from the faith. And then when I read this text, um, most of us have the framework where we all know that Thomas was the doubting disciple is what we would say. But I think what seems to be implied in the text, Thomas wasn't the only one. You kind of get what I'm saying? And, and what's striking about this word doubted that's written in, in, in the original language is what the word is saying. It, it's not so much doubt so in the, in the sense that I don't believe in you, but it was doubt in the sense like I'm not sure that I'm seeing what I'm seeing. You kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah. Because if I were to ask the majority of you in here, do you believe in God? I believe overwhelmingly everyone would say yes. But when it comes to actually walking it out, some of us are like this. I'm not sure. Are you with me? Come on now. Yeah, I'm not sure. And so what happens is we go about our journey because of our doubt or our, our uncertainty. We don't represent boldly. Ah, uh, come on. Is this making sense? Yeah, yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? So, so folks see you, and they don't know if you're a Dallas fan or a Bronco fan because you're not sure. I'm going to stick with the metaphor. Or they don't know if you're following Christ or if you're following the world because we're not necessarily confident that Jesus can do what he said he could do. So you have to see this. You understand with me, just prior to his resurrection, when they took him away to crucify him, remember the text says that the disciples scattered. So all of a sudden, this man showed up and you had about 10 guys that had abandoned him where Peter was the only one following him around to see what's going on to happen. Then he, he gets up and he says, meet me somewhere. And I could see some of them peeking around the corner. Is that really you? Is that really who you said you are? While some, the text says, are worshiping him, right? And so it says, 
then verse 18 says, and Jesus came, and look at this, and he said to them, all authority, come on, say all authority. authority. Say it like you mean it, say all authority. authority. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. I want to share two things, and I'm going to move quickly to the text. Number one, here's what I want you to understand as it relates to us being radical disciples for Christ. Number one, we need to know that Jesus conquering the grave provides the believer with the authority they need or we need to establish king, his kingdom on earth. By virtue of the fact that he conquered the grave, it gives us every, well, let me say it more simply, it gives us bragging rights. Come on, y'all say amen. amen. It gives us bragging rights. So notice, notice the text. Notice what the text says. And let's, let's walk through this, and I want to share a couple of things with you, okay? So notice what it says here. And Jesus came to them and says, all authority, all authority, that Greek word exousia is used there, which means that he, 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 he arose with everything that he need in his possession to do what he needs to do, okay? So, so Satan no longer had authority over him. In other words, when he died and he arose from the grave, he conquered the enemy's domain. Okay, let me explain what I mean, then we're going to move forward with that. You must understand that Satan was authorized to be the prince over the earth, okay? So the earth really is his domain when you think about it. And what Jesus did, Jesus' goal is to establish his kingdom in the enemy's domain such that his kingdom subject can realize that they have authority in a domain that's not even theirs, Come on, it's just making sense. So here's Jesus. Here's Jesus. He comes, and he, you know how it says, I think it's in Matthew 4, where the enemy came and tempted him after he was baptized. Then he lives life, and then all of a sudden he goes through everything that he needs to go through. And then, to, to make it striking, he died, and then he's buried. Now, if, if, if I'm the enemy or if I'm Satan at that particular point in time, I'm thinking I've won. I'm thinking it's over. I'm thinking I have Jesus locked in the belly of the grave. But does anybody in here know the grave couldn't keep him in? Come on, does anybody, come on, y'all, don't fool me. Does anybody in here know? So here's the thing that he's saying to his disciples. Listen, you must understand, I emerged with the keys to death, hell, and the grave in that I have defeated the very enemy himself over the earth realm. So what I'm about to say to you is I'm not telling you something I want to do. Look at my hands. I've got all the Super Bowl rings you need to get. So he emerged with all authority, meaning that he has been granted authority over Satan domain. Okay? And then lock into this because notice number two. So now he extends his authority. He extends his authority or his kingdom over the entire earth realm. Matthew 6 puts it this way. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? How? As it is in heaven. So I need you to see, because Jesus emerged from the dead, imagine with me an imaginary line now connecting earth and heaven, saying whatever happens in heaven to some extent can also happen here on earth. Why can it happen here? Because I have authority over the earth. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but next week I want to show you how much authority you and I have because of what happened on Calvary over the stuff we go through here on the earth. So he extends that. He extends that. He says, all authority has been given to me. And then he, lets, he, he outlines the scope or the realm of his authority in heaven and on earth has been granted to me. And I like that because we already know him to be Lord of the heavens. And what he's really saying now, by virtue of the fact that he was raised from the dead on the third day, he took the sting out of death. He robbed the grave of its victory. So here's what he says in Corinthians. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? So, so this is what this looked like. Where the enemy thought he had me captive, where he thought he had buried me, where he thought he had ended my true purpose. He did not realize my true purpose for coming was to die and be raised again by virtue of the fact that I got up. I have revealed to him that he has nothing on me. 
So he now has reign. He now has presidents. He now has rulership. He now has governance over the earth realm. Come on, say all authority belongs to Jesus. Now here's what that means. It means now that he can establish his kingdom on earth, okay? So as you move over to the next one, so here's the second thing I want you to understand. Because he has authority, God's kingdom now will be, let me change the verb a little bit, will be established when you and I understand that we have been commissioned to go and do what? Make disciples of who? Yeah, let me say it again, let me say it again, let me say it again. God's kingdom now will be established in the earth realm when you and I understand we have been commissioned to go and make disciples of all people. Here's what I've been saying um, as we were doing vision casting the entirety of last Sunday. God has already done his part. It's on us now to do our part, right? So let me say it like this. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are what? So the problem is not the harvest, okay? It's what? Does this not make sense? The problem is not the harvest. The problem is what? Can we just be honest with ourselves? Uh, nobody get offended here. Do not get offended, okay? The problem is not God. Point to yourself and say the problem is me. Come on, y'all just, just humor me. Come on, yeah. Yeah, can we be honest with ourselves? This is why we come to learn. The problem is not the laborers. The problem is me, okay? You kind of get what I'm saying? I refuse to wear the jersey. <laughs> Look at the text. So here's what he says. All authority has been given on me in heaven and earth, verse 19. And then he uses this Greek word, poor you or mine. And here's what it says. Go, therefore, and make disciples. 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 Okay, I'm going to explain this because if you don't get anything else, I want you to grab this concept. Here's what did not happen. Here's what did not happen um, when Jesus made that statement to the 11 disciples. Peter did not turn to John and say, okay, John, I got you. John didn't turn to Bartholomew. Bartholomew, I've got you. And Bartholomew didn't turn to James and say, hey, James, I've got you. And James didn't turn to the, on Judas and say, hey, Judas, I've got you. You kind of get where I'm going with this, right? So the commission or the instruction was not to take people who are already fans and make them more committed fans. The commission was for you to adopt this marketing strategy that Jesus is trying to get to understand, put on your jersey, and go sell me. Oh, I don't need y'all to track. Come on, somebody say amen. Let me know. I want y'all to get this. I want you to get this. Such that when people see you, they'll know that I just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, because here's the deal. Here's the deal. And, 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 and we'll, pick, we'll pick this up next week. What he's really trying to say implicitly is that I really never had a losing season. So if you want to bet on me, I'm guaranteeing you wins all the time. Are you here? Come on, somebody say amen. Let me know you're with me, okay? That I'm guaranteeing you wins all the time because I have all authority. So then he uses this, this, these two interesting verbs, go, and then he says, and make disciples. Okay, that's striking because what that word go means, as simple as the word uh, uh, kind of implies or speaks to itself, leave where you are, come on, does this make sense? And then disperse yourself from where you are, and here's the make disciples part, that Greek word, matthew, which simply means, and we talked about this several weeks ago, get people to follow me. See, here's how we define discipleship, right? Growing deeper in Christ. Growing deeper in Christ. That's a part of it, okay? But discipleship does not begin with growing deeper in Christ. Discipleship begins with individuals going to the fan shop and buying the right jersey. 
Oh, come on, talk to me this morning. Yeah, yeah. Discipleship begins when you take off the, the gear that you had and put on the new stuff. Then I can teach you how to wear how to wear it well. Come on. This is why it kind of puts it this way in Corinthians. If any person is in Christ, what happens to them? They are a new what? Create. The old has gone and the new has what? Come, you kind of, and look, this is what the text says. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself. So he has all authority, and now he's saying, go market me into the world. Go market me. So if I'm going to make disciples, it begins with me as an individual going places where people who are not disciples are and showing them my stuff. The church doesn't get this. So what we want to do is we want to meet Jesus in Galilee every Sunday. Right? Y'all get it? And, and disciple each other. So here's what it looks like. Reed looks to Joy. Joy, I got you. I'm going to disciple you, girl. <laughs> and you look at your neighbor and I'm going to disciple you. Okay? And then you say, where are your disciples? Who are you making? And we say, see them? They're all sitting right there. And everybody meets at Galilee every Sunday. And you really aren't discipling. Because all you're talking about is how good the game was and how you won, but nobody's being converted to your team. If he says, go and make disciples, meaning that we have an obligation to leave somewhere and go somewhere else so others can see the God in us. And I'll talk a lot more about this um, in the upcoming weeks. And then a conversion takes place. Why you like him so much? Let me tell you what he did. Why are you following him so much? Let me tell you who he is. Why are you so committed to him? Let me tell you how he brought me out. You see, I used to have cancer, but he delivered me. Come on. I was sick, but he made me whole. I was hungry, and he fed me. I was lonely. Come on. And he was my companion. I was naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he healed me. Let me tell you about the steam that I'm on. And then it presses you to conversion, it presses you to conversion, it presses you to conversion because you want to be a part of the team. You kind of get what I'm saying? So he says, go and make disciples. And he uses this interesting word, um, of all nations, of all nations, of all nations. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to leave it alone because we'll pick it up next week. So in other words, if I'm going to make disciples of all nations, it seems to me that all unsafe people look alike regardless of ethnicity. Y'all all right? Yeah. Because here's how we do making the disciples. We we'll go around, and if a person don't look like us, we just walk right by them until we find somebody who looks like us. See, Reed looks like me. <laughs> yeah. And we kind of stop. Those of you that were here on Wednesday, do you have any spiritual beliefs? <laughs> kind of get what I'm saying? And then we keep skipping over folk that don't look like us. And so how does that play itself out? We come to worship, and all of us look alike. Oh, let me go back up here. You're about to stone me. Yeah. <laughs> of every nation, and if I'm walking out the Spirit of God, I don't care who you are, what you look like, where you're from, right? You kind of get what I'm saying? By virtue of the fact that you don't know Christ, my job is to make a disciple of you, okay? Now, lock into this. The, pro the world gets this a lot more than we are. You ever been to a football game? You see how diverse those fans are? And you see how it is once they put their jersey on, they're all rooting for the same team? Come on. Y'all missing this. Come on. And you see how they can worship together in that same sanctuary? And when their team on the floor score, scores a touchdown, how they all celebrate, and they look at each other, yeah, high-five each other, regardless of what they look like, what's the problem with the church? <laughs> Assuming we're living out the command. Assuming we're living out the command, right? Make disciples, okay? Let me give you this last thing, and then I'm going to stop, because we're going to pick this up next week. So I'll just put it out there, and we'll share it. Okay, look at this. Baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 says you do this by doing what? Teaching them to have what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. And then the last thing is what? And behold, I am with you for how long? Until the end of the age. Let me give you these two things, then we're going to pick it up next week. So here's the thing that I want you to get. Okay, so we're commissioned to go and make disciples. The bottom line is all people are target. And I love this real quick. And the process of discipleship, I like this, in creating places for people to do what? Baptizing them to do what? Believe, teaching them, and then to what? Behave to help them obey all grace. I'm going to pick that up next week, okay? I'm going to pick it up next week. Here's the last thing I want you all to get, and then we'll talk. I'm going to stop. So God's presence guarantees the believer diplomatic immunity when infiltrating the enemy's camp with the message of the gospel. Yeah. Y'all want to come back next week. Yeah, you want to come back. You want to come back next week. You want to come back. This is what all authority means, diplomatic immunity. Yeah, so, so you can go do, y'all know what the term means, right? Yeah, yeah, you have, have your flags on your car. <laughs> yeah, we'll pick this up next week. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, this week, I am going to go and make a disciple. Next neighbor, say, neighbor, this week, I am going to go. And make a disciple. I just want to lay that foundation. I just want to lay that foundation because I want us to get in our head the picture of taking off the old jersey and putting on a new one and then selling it to the world. I just want you to leave here with that image, with that picture in your mind that I am a marketing representative for God. And I want folk to buy what I'm selling. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. Come on, worship team. Come on with me. Bow your heads. I just want to pray. I want to pray. So here's how I want to pray this morning as the worship team comes and then Pastor Kay is going to come and we're going to share uh, some things with you. I want you really, really seriously, honestly and wholeheartedly, let the church get back to the place where we are bold agents for Christ. The term I'm using is radical disciples, sold out for God committed to making followers for Christ. So right where you're sitting, if you know God in your life as personal Lord and Savior, just you go to God and say, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation, create a new spirit in me, and motivate me all over again. And allow God to be God. Just allow him to speak to you. Allow him to be God in your midst, just in your own way. In your own way, you go to him. Bless the Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome. By your prayers, Lord. God, we thank you for you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for how you're moving in our midst. You're a wonderful God, Lord. You're a gracious God. You're a mighty God. Thank you for your word. As we look more at this passage in front of us, God, speak to us. Convict us. Motivate us. We want to raise up leaders, God. People that are not afraid to tell a dying world of a Savior who came to seek and to save that which was lost. We have to go. We have to leave here. We have to go into the world. And we need to market our team. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. If there's one here today that don't know you, that have not said yes to you, I'm praying, God, that they hear your voice. Because the reason we're here is we want to be on the same team and your spirit is speaking, your spirit is moving. So be God as we give our hearts to you, God. You're a wonderful Savior. Thank you for what you're doing. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.